Welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. This series is brought to you by the IDEAS Productivity Project, which is part of the XA Scale Computing Project of the United States Department of Energy. The series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley and will be the host for today's webinar, Effective Strategies for Writing Proposal Work Plans for Research Software. And the webinar will be presented by Chase Million. Chase is the founder and CEO of Million Concepts, a company that provides research software engineering and research support services, in particular in the fields of planetary science and astronomy. He has almost 20 years of experience in the field, and he has written mission support software for a number of NASA missions, including the Mars rovers and the Galaxy Evolution Explorer Space Telescope. He has worked on a, as a software project manager and has served as a PI on multiple software-heavy grant-funded projects. Chase is one of the 2021 Better Scientific Software Fellows, and he is an advocate for open source software, open data, and high-quality research software and data archiving. Uh, related to this webinar, there is a podcast that Chase produced. I'll paste the link to that in the chat momentarily. We have issued 100 plus tickets to, to, for today's webinar. And um, all attendees have been muted upon entry. Uh, well, we'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also good Google Doc will be reading those for Chase. With that, Chase, please. Up my shine. All right. Hello. Thank you, Osney, for the uh, wonderful introduction. I'm Chase, and I am uh, associated with all of the fact that Osney just reported about me. This is, uh, as he said, a um, a work product from my better scientific software fellowship. The major work product of this is a, is a 50 page document that goes into real detail on all of the things I'm gonna to cover today. There's too much for me to cover in an hour. So this is just a teaser and I'll have a link to that document at the end. Hopefully you, you go look, you read it and find it useful. So first of all, um, here's just uh, my bona fides. This is basically what, what Osney just said. I'm not in the field of, uh, 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 in, in the domain of the national lab, so most of you are not familiar with me. This is uh, perhaps evidence that I may know what I'm talking about, although I'm not 100% uh, confident in that. So what we'll be discussing today is how to write work plans for proposals. And this is based upon a thesis that I developed uh, over, 10 years of writing dozens and dozens of proposals which failed uh, and eventually uh, hitting on a, a formula that led to a, a, a string of proposals uh, disproportionate to the statistical likelihood of, of, those, uh, of those being successful. Um, oh, I, I should also say, please interrupt me with questions at any point, type them in the chat, Osney will, Osney will break in. Uh, I'd love to be distracted by questions. So, the thing I observed is that as both a writer and reviewer of proposals, most scientists don't have a background in systems engineering, project engineering, project management. And as a result, proposal work plans in particular tend to suck. I've written many proposals, been a client on many proposals and reviewed many, many proposals where the work plan ended up taking maybe two pages of the 15 page allotment. And that fact always comes up in the review. It always, it, it always ends up being a ding on the proposal, um, which makes sense because you're asking for a tremendous amount of money to do something. And uh, it's reasonable for the funding agency to want to know what you are going to do with that money. Rarely does it come up in proposals whether the work is worth doing. If you are a scientist and you have, you have a position in an organization that allows you to write proposals, it's sort of presumed that the things that you want to do are things that are worth doing, that you are solving real problems and addressing real needs. Chase, just a, um, um, uh, it seems that um, your sound is a little bit low, uh, the microphone. Can move the mouse a bit better. Let's try it. Is that 
that's better. Then, yeah, keep, keep going, please. Okay. Um, so the whole secret is that there's not a secret to writing a good work plan. You just have to have a plan. And, and like I said, because many of us were not trained in these things, we don't have plans to describe. So um, again, over, over years of, of failures and reading a stack of books that I'll refer you to at the end of the presentation, I, I learned how you make such plans. And in particular, I learned that for the type of work that we tend to do, um, the plans aren't really that complicated to know how to go about creating. You still have to do a lot of work to create them, but it's rather simple to understand the basic principles of making the plan in the first place. Some of those, um, uh, so the key steps are, are uh, you have to scope the project, you have to know its boundaries, you have to know what the requirements of the project are, you have to make an estimate for the project, so how, how much resources will it, will, will it take, and then you have to make a schedule for the project, which is how is the effort going to be distributed over time. Some of the key observations that I made of, uh, while digging through the literature on scoping and estimation for projects uh, is that, again, in our domain, um, so what I'm talking about are tend to be smallish research projects, so like less than five people, maybe less than a few million dollars. Um, the, there are estimation strategies that work very effectively in that domain that are easy to grasp. It is also possible for us to sort of play fast and loose with project management roles and standards, and that has to do with the nature of, of sort of fundamental research. Um, I go into this in great length in, in the document. So. If you question me on those things, you should read my full argument first. Uh, and the basic principle, the basic idea of estimation here is something called task decomposition, which is to say you break up the project into smaller projects, smaller tasks. Each of those in itself is easier to estimate. You estimate all of those, and then you assemble them all back together in the end to make a final estimate. So I'm going to quickly run through all those steps. Again, I can't can't explain this in just uh, 45 minutes, but there isn't a document to, uh, to refer to. So the first step is, uh, is to create a vision and a scope for your project. That is, what is it we are trying to do? This should be a statement, maybe a few sentences, not more than a paragraph, that all of the stakeholders of your project, that, are, that is the, the people you're collaborating with, the people who will actually be doing the work, the technical people, everyone should agree this is the thing that we are trying to do. And this should be the foundation of your whole proposal and your whole estimation project. Uh, this is surprisingly hard to do. Many people skip this step. It's very easy to write a sentence that two people read and take completely different things away from. So you will have to get, get everyone in the room and really iterate on this and make them explain what does this sentence mean to you? What does this statement mean to you? Make sure everyone's on the same page with the vision and scope. In business context, which is where I've gotten a lot of my training, this is sort of equivalent to the elevator pitch. That is, uh, you're, in, you're stuck in an elevator with someone who's going to invest in your company. You have 28 seconds to sell them on your company. Uh, this is the statement you give them. If your elevator pitch is not good as in business as in a proposal, um, then the, the project is not probably not very well scoped and it's going to be hard to sell as a proposal. The second step of scoping and estimation is something called a concept of operations document. In informal project management training, this has, this has a real meaning. It's defined in an IEEE standard. Uh, I mostly ignore that for these purposes because uh, within, a, within, a, uh, within a smallish research context, usually that level of precision is not important. And those documents were written for, uh, for industrial contexts and, and large, uh, large projects. Basically, how you create a concept of operations document is you interview the, the users of your software. This would be the, the, uh, some fraction of the stakeholders, the COI and the PI, if it's a small research project, the, um, the grad students who might be using the software. And from their perspective, uh, get a sense of what is the current situation that is trying to be solved by the software? Um, what are the critical features of the new system that need to exist? for a solution. You'll get a bunch of different perspectives on this. There's probably not a solution that exists. In that case, you need to explain 
the context in which people have worked around it. Maybe they've made prototypes. Maybe they've had hack solutions that they've implemented for years. Uh, a lot of the work we do, we take software that's been around for 30 years, and then we refactor into something more modern that can be better, better maintained. In the same document, we want to describe the proposed system, uh, and then pass that document around to everyone you've interviewed and make sure that they agree that you've represented them fairly. Again, this is a, it's a short slide, but it's five bullet points. Um, this is a really hard thing to learn, how to talk to users and understand what they really need, what their real problems are, and I do not have a quick way of, uh, of conveying that. But um, where I learned it was in uh, te technology startup incubators. This is a technique they teach uh, that they call customer discovery, which is that you go out in the world and you talk to people who might be users of your product and you uh, figure out what their pain points are so that you can solve them. So if you want to, uh, if you want to go uh, try to train yourself from textbooks how to do this sort of thing, look into, uh, into things like, I think there's a document called uh, Talking to Humans. Um, there, there are various startup manuals for how to do this sort of customer discovery thing. But the best way to learn it is to just, just do it a lot. Uh, the third part is requirement specification. So a requirement specification document is again, a formal IEEE standard. Um, and I, I have it referenced at the, I have the exact number referenced at the end of the, the talk. Um, it's very useful to read that document. It contains a lot of useful information, but again, the formality in the context in which I'm talking about is probably less important. Basically, what a requirement specification is, is that it is a, a list of conditions such that if all of them are met, the project vision and scope will be achieved. Um, the, uh, the, um, the categories of what makes a requirement can be a little tricky. So uh, a requirement is what the software must be, not what it must do. So at this stage, you want to be careful not to instantiate technical solutions as requirements. So if unless uh, writing your software in Python is a real requirement of the job, like it's in your contract, then the language in which you write the, the software is not a requirement. Uh, another example I use is the difference between a, a software that displays an image and image display software. The second one is not a requirement, the first one is a requirement. It's a little tricky, but once you get the hang of the difference between a requirement and not, it, uh, it's very useful and it will also save you pain down the line trying to build the wrong thing. Once you've made that list, you should rank the list. Um, I usually rank the list based on uh, speed to um, minimum viable product, uh, but you can rank the list of, upon many different axes. And you should also category everything, uh, categorize everything in the list as a, a critical requirement a stretch requirement and a nice to have requirement. And then cross out everything that's stretch and nice to have, because by definition, those are not requirements. Again, that's a problem I see a lot and uh, that I used, to, I used to do a lot is uh, dragging along a bunch of requirements on my project that are not real requirements. You'll save yourself headaches by not doing that. And, uh, and finally, the accuracy, the completeness of your requirements document is uh, going to form the foundation for the estimation. So if the requirements are not complete, uh, the estimation will be wrong uh, and, and it can be wrong quite badly. So in service to that, here's a list of common software requirement categories that uh, you should review and make sure that you're hitting all of these when uh, any of that are necessary when you're doing your requirements. I go into more detail in, uh, on these in the, uh, in the document. Many of these are defined in the IEEE standards as well, and I won't go through all of them, but uh, you should use this as a reference. We do, we, we in my company use exactly this list when we're making requirements to make sure that we fit everything. So having done uh, scoping, uh, we've established the boundaries of the project and the requirements of the project. It's time to get into the estimation part. Uh, so the, uh, like I said before, the strategy we're using for estimation is something called task decomposition. And in service to that, we are going to build something called a work breakdown structure. And these are terms of art and, you know, I've, I've settled with them a little, but, uh, but these are terms of art you should be familiar with and you can search these terms to learn more about them. Uh, 
The steps to creating a work breakdown structure, are, first of all, uh, figure out a technical solution. So up to this point, you should have avoided the temptation to uh, commit yourself to some specific technical solution. At this point, you should you should pick one. You may pick among pick a few, uh, find the one that you think is most likely to lead you to success. At this point, you can always revisit this step. Given that technical solution, break the solution down into tasks and subtasks, each one of which should be um, small enough, but no smaller, that you can conceive of doing it. It is not important at this point that you actually know how to do it, but you need to look at each task and say, I could probably do that, or this person on my staff could probably do that. They all need to be uh, what I call achievable goals. I love achievable goals. It's my favorite kind of goal. Um, in any project, again, at the scale we're talking about, I would suggest maybe 10 to 20 of these if it's a big research project, maybe 40. If you have too many, uh, if you've gone to fine resolution, maybe your project is too hard or you've, uh, or you've just decomposed too much, but you should resist that urge as well. Also, even though you have a technical solution at this point, avoid making any unnecessary technical solutions. Um, if there are things that you can leave open at this, this, this stage, do, because later in the project, when it comes time to implement those things, you'll have a lot more information and a lot better basis to make informed decisions about how to do that stuff. Um, and, then, uh, and then again, your, the quality of your estimate will rely uh, inextricably on the completeness of your work breakdown structure. Um, so uh, to that end, here's a list of commonly forgotten task categories that we use within my business um, when we are doing these estimations to make sure we've hit everything. I won't go through all of these, but you should use this as a reference. Um, there are lots of things that are commonly forget, forgotten that will, um, will really eat up a lot of time. And if you forget them, then you'll be in a bad place. One of them, for example, is just IT management, like even merely updating the virus checker on your computer or, uh, or backing up data, um, writing documentation, communicating with end users and customers, those things all, all in fact take a lot more time and can sometimes rival the actual development work and the amount of time that they take. So um, now onto the estimation. You have a work breakdown structure that is all of the tasks such that if all of the tasks are completed, your requirements will be met and your project will be completed successfully. For each of those tasks, go through them one by one. For each of them, make an estimate um, in terms of billable hours, that is the number of hours you'll actually spend doing the work, of what it will take you to complete each task. When possible, the people who are going to do this work should be the ones making the estimate. Um, there may be a few exceptions, like if you're working with, uh, with new grad students who don't have a lot of experience, they might not have a good basis to make these estimates. But if you're working with uh, career professionals, those are the people who should be making these estimates for themselves. They will be in the best position to judge. For each of those time estimates, so you've made an initial time estimate, let's say uh, the task is uh, bake a cake and it's two hours. Um, for each one of those, then assign a confidence factor. And the confidence factor is going to be chosen from 1.2, I'll explain why in a minute, two, three, or four where 1.2 is the most confident you are in your ability to achieve that task and four is the least confident you are. You will now have a new column where every estimate that you initially made is, uh, is given a confidence factor. So let's say we're, building, we're baking a cake. I think it will take me two hours, but I think I've baked three cakes in my life. So pretty sure I can do it, but it might get a little hairy. I'm gonna assign that a confidence factor of two. Now, for all of your tasks, you have, uh, there's two things you can learn from this. First of all, if you sum your initial estimates, so that would be two hours in the case of the cake, uh, that, is your, uh, that is your best case scenario estimate. So that is the amount of time that you might expect the project to take if everything goes exactly as you expected, because those are the conditions under which you made those initial estimates. Um, if the project, does not have as many resources as that indicates you will need, then the project is probably, in my opinion, doomed to failure. And you should either try to get more resources or change the scope of the project. 
The other thing you can learn from this is by doing a pairwise multiplication across the initial estimate and the scale factor, um, and then summing that, uh, that produces the what I will call the project estimate. This is the amount of, of time, of resources, that are likely reasonable and sufficient to achieve the project objectives. Again, there are a lot of caveats in that, uh, a lot of things that can go wrong. If your requirements aren't complete, it's gonna be wrong. If your work, task, your work breakdown structure is incomplete, it's gonna be wrong. Um, but in general, this is, uh, uh, this is a reasonable first estimate. And uh, I also know, if, if you haven't seen this method before, that you're probably thinking it seems like I made it up and it's complete BS. But I assure you this, this has a real basis in the literature of project estimation. And also it works. Uh, we use it in my company. We've been using this method uh, pretty consistently for four years and we've had very good success with it. Um, the only time while using this method that we've had a project run over was because uh, I did not follow my own, own advice and uh, and use the uh, allowed the estimate to be negotiated down from what it should have been. If we'd taken the resources that we needed to do the project, it would have been successful. So it sounds magic, but I promise it works. So let's talk about those scale factors for a second. Um, 1.2 uh, is, uh, so you might think of that as like a 20% increase of your initial estimate. The reason for this is because Everyone underestimates everything, even experienced estimators, even experienced software engineers. Everyone is more optimistic consistently about the time it will take them to do something, even something they have done precisely the same way before. So for that reason, we just uh, we tack a 20% margin onto even the best case scenario. Um, a category two, uh, uncertainty factor two, is for things in which you have deep domain expertise, you may have done something similar but not something exact. Most things in a research project will fall under a two. There's a lot of tasks like uh, communicating with um, communicating with clients and doing IT work that will just fall under two because those are things you've done before or done sim similar enough things before. Um, the really hard work for most research projects tends to be a, a Pareto um, distribution. You'll have a few things out of four. Most things should be ones or twos. Uh, three is just somewhere between two and four, and then four is a task for which you're confident that you can succeed, but you have no idea how. So that, that tends to be the real meat of the research project. If there are algorithms uh, that you need to work out, uh, if there's hard optimizations that you need to do, all of those things will come under four. Um, and again, I, I know the people doing the work should be the ones who do this. And, and I caution all of my employees and everyone that how, when you're doing this, think about yourself, how you will do the work, how long it will take you, because uh, we tend to compare ourselves to others and other people would do it faster or better and we think we should be able to do that. How long it would take someone else is irrelevant and should not enter as a factor into this at all, unless you can hire those people. And then by all means, hire someone who can do it faster. Here's an example of this. This is an actual, uh, estimation, uh, it's a clip from an estimation document that we produced in my company for a contract. Um, you can see we have descriptions of the task. This is from our work breakdown structure. Um, we, we categorize it under the specific deliverable and then we have all the tasks therein. Some of those things are communicate with the customers like there, write documentation, uh, follow on bug releases. And then we produce time estimates for each of those tasks. Um, in this project, we had some repeating tasks, so we included an items column, and then we assigned the uncertainty factor to all of those tasks. We add them up, and uh, this is the project estimate. That is the basis of, of the quote that we gave to the client in this case. We also tend to have a notes column, so we like to uh, note in here if there's, any, if there's any unusual basis for the uncertainty factor. We uh, chose sometimes there are huge unknowns in the project and like it could be a two and it could be a four depending on some specific, uh, the answer to some specific question. Sometimes we can get answers to those, sometimes we can't. Here's another example. So it's a little, this was a, a much messier, uh, a quick one-off within the company for a specific project. And it's the same sort of thing. The only difference here is we rounded the hours. I think there's enough uh, uncertainty in this method that rounding to the nearest whole hour is not going to not going to hurt the process at all. 
So this is just a summary of the estimation algorithm, um, which I won't read, but this is a, a good quick reference for everything that I just talked about on the previous one. And then a few co uh, caveats of estimation. First of all, this is very important and it's hard for a lot of people to internalize. The goal of an estimate is not accuracy. Um, when you set out to create an estimate at the beginning of a project, uh, and this is uh, this is not this is not my realization. This is uh, uh, this is from the literature. Um, when you set out to create an estimate at the beginning of a project, you are trying to figure out what the project will take at the time in the project when you have the least information about it. That problem is probably even worse in academic settings when you're writing a proposal at the sort of pre-proposal phase. Um, you've probably done none of the work because you haven't been funded to do any of the work. So there's not even sort of a pre-work basis. There's not, there wasn't a pilot study. Um, you probably have almost no information about how the project will actually go. On top of that, you might be pushing the edges of what can be known and can be done. So there's just all sorts of uncertainty there. If you if you are hoping you'll get a number at the end that says this will take a thousand hours of work and then it takes a thousand hours of work, you'll be disappointed. The merit factor of an estimate is whether it is useful. And for our purposes, it is useful if we are able to successfully request the amount of resources that are both necessary and sufficient for us to reasonably guarantee a successful project outcome. Um, in some research context, that might not even be the thing you originally set out to do. Um, in some it may, but the goal is to get the resources that you need and to have a reasonable basis for those. Uh, second important point, and I, I talked about how I failed to do this um, a few years ago and suffered for it. Uh, an estimate is not the basis for a negotiation. So there is a, um, there's a trope in Star Wars where the captain, uh, you know, the, the Borg are attacking and the captain calls down the engine room and says, how long will it take to get to warp? And the chief engineer says it'll take 15 minutes and the captain says it'll, you have five minutes and then the engineer does it in five minutes. Uh, what I take from this is that the engineering team lies to the captain. I'm told that's actually Star Trek canon. Uh, unfortunately, many people in our sort of domain have learned their management style from Star Trek and think that they can just negotiate down from the estimate. Uh, resist the urge to do that. The estimate is the estimate. It came out of a fairly objective process. If it needs to be done faster, then something needs to change. If more needs to be done with the same resources, something needs to be changed. Also, the estimate that you initially produce is going to be wrong, the reasons I previously explained. So you should re-estimate pretty frequently throughout a project. You should certainly re-estimate when the conditions of the project change, if the final deliverable changes or some requirement has changed. But you should also re-estimate maybe four times throughout the project or, um, or annually or quarterly uh, throughout long-running projects. And that is, not to make sure, that is not to make sure that you are still on track with your estimate. Although it can do that, it can alert you very quickly to problems in the project as a whole, but it is to, um, it is to allow you the opportunity to change things in the project so that you can still get within the, uh, within the estimate cap. So you might have to change your technical approach, you might have to request more money, you might have to change the final deliverable but you will never know those things unless you go through this whole exercise again, this project. And then, uh, and then the final thing, the, the thing I billboarded at the top of this uh, talk is the point of all of this, is how to put this in a proposal. So um, all of this work is for not, if you cannot convince the review panel that you have a, uh, you have a reasonable and sufficient basis upon which to request the funds that you're requesting do the work that you want to do. And there, um, there are a couple artifacts that also come out of this project management uh, literature that are very, very convincing to review panels. And I will go through those uh, very quickly. First of all, I'll note that the work breakdown structure forms uh, naturally 
section and subsection headings for a proposal. And that's how I've written my last few proposals. In fact, I've taken the WVS that we made during the project scoping, just made those section and subsection headings uh, and, and filled in exactly what we talked about for all of those tests um, and uh, you know, adjusted accordingly to make it readable. But doing all of this pre-work will actually improve your experience of writing proposals in my experience. And then, and then there's a few uh, graphical artifacts that I'll go into. And I'll note, there is specialized software for doing all of this, but a spreadsheet program will serve your needs just fine unless you are really managing one of, you know, a big research proposal. If you were building, for example, the most powerful supercomputer in the world, uh, you probably want real project managers doing real project management, uh, using real project management tools and probably a different estimation strategy than that. Chase, there is a question for you. Sure thing. How does this handle the situ situations in which um, your resources, people, are split between multiple sponsors' projects? In particular, overhead, you know, the overhead of context switching. Um, so uh, the overhead of context. So yes, yeah, so it's like the same as task switching. Basically, you have um, so, for example, for me, uh, I'm currently active on, we'll say, uh, a dozen different projects, and on any one day I'll be working on, I'll, I'll touch four, four of those, and the, the ramp up and ramp down time between those two tasks um, is a cost, and someone needs to bear that cost who's not me, because it, it, that cost just exists. Um, the... Um, the estimation that I already covered itself does not take that into account, and it probably should, and I don't have a good answer for that. Um, when you're creating the plan, which I'll go into in a few slides, which is to say the Gantt chart, um, you should take that into account. You should take a uh, task spin up and spin down into account. Um, so I don't, that's a very good question. I don't have a good answer for it. If it's something you were really worried about, I'd probably just add like 10% to everything and call it a day, um, whatever you think a good ramp up and ramp down time would be. Did I answer the correct question, Alton? Um, yes, thank you. Okay. I, well, I, I didn't answer, but I addressed the correct question. No, the participant is happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first artifact is something called a task matrix. This just ties objectives to requirements. It might, you can do something called a science traceability matrix that ties requirements to scientific questions or a, a task to scientific questions. It looks like this. This is obviously just a, a um, this is a mock-up of this kind of idea. But basically for every requirement in your requirement list, you have a specific thing that your project will do or things. There can be multiple tasks for one requirement multiple requirements for one task um, that to which those things are tied. And this is a very good way to quickly convince yourself and also the review panel that everything that needs to be done will get done. You have a plan for doing all of those things. Um, and there's a, there's a good document produced as part of a, a NASA training um, here on science traceability matrix matrices for, uh, for missions. So you can go here and get more information on that. The second artifact is called a Gantt chart. It was named after a guy named Gantt. It's not an acronym. Um, the Gantt chart shows the distribution of work effort uh, across tasks and time. Um, and uh, it's, it's essentially a schedule of work. Now, the time in this case is calendar time. So that's the thing I was just talking about. So when we do the estimate, we do billable time. And the amount of time you're going to bill to the project. That is almost never the same thing as calendar time. That is in part because many people in a research context don't work full time on any one particular project. You might only have half of their time or a quarter of their time. Also, there are critical events in any project that everyone has to wait on. There are things, there are things that have to be created as inputs to other things. So the project in calendar time will might be you know, three, four times the amount of hours in estimated time. The conversion between those two things is again very complicated and there's no fixed formula and it's just something you have to think really hard about. 
how do all things rely on all other things? Um, but even without that, um, uh, even without knowing how to do that, like you can create a basic Gantt chart uh, uh, pretty quickly. They look like this. You've probably, I'm sure you've seen them. Um, this is sort of my take on it. Also, I like to highlight what we have here. These are the number of hours assigned each task. This is the estimate. Um, so that's the, the initial estimate times the uncertainty factor. So that's the amount of resources we're requesting to support this task. Um, so the number of hours committed to the task is equal to the resources we're requesting. And then for each period of time, we have a total amount of work um, assigned to that period of time. So that's going to be across all people. And what I like to look for here is just that this is, this is pretty smooth. Um, having big spikes in project output uh, tend, tend to be lossy, again, for that ramp up and ramp, ramp down rate season, although sometimes it's unavoidable. And then I like to just because uh, because reviewers like to pull out their calculators and make sure everything adds up properly. Uh, that's that's a gotcha I've seen from review panels. Uh, I like to include a checksum to make sure it's all correct. So here's a, here's a real project Gantt chart. This is for a project that we proposed um, that was successfully funded, and it shows all of the things that I just explained. In addition to that, um, we have uh, we have task leads assigned each task. This is a thing that reviewers like to see. They like to see that someone is in charge of everything that's being done. Instead of hours here, I have fractional FTEs. Um, you know, the, the third decimal point in general probably doesn't matter too much, but because uh, I wanted all the numbers to actually add up correctly, uh, I used three decimal points of precision. But that's an example of that. Here's another one, which I know you can't read, but it's in the slides that we distributed, and you can it's also in the document. Um, and then these are these are the things I already explained about um, just making sure everything checks out because reviewers will pull out their calculators and double check you. So a few, a few uh, final tips for writing proposals. Uh, this, this first thing, in my opinion, is the most useful thing in this entire presentation. Uh, even if you don't do anything else in this presentation, I think this will improve proposals in which you have had inadequate work plans in the past. And that is that the work plan should compose at least 30% of the page allotment. So many proposals ask for 15 page page allotments, uh, 15 page limits. Uh, five of those at least should be your work plan. It's absolutely okay to burn a whole page on your Gantt chart. That can be one of your five pages, but at least a third, um, at least a third should be the page allotment. This is actually policy in my company. It is in our it is in our rules and procedures document. We do not ship a proposal anymore um, unless this is true. A second thing to keep in mind is that reviewers tend to um, reviewers on review panels uh, will tend to have two to I've seen 15 different proposals that they are responsible for reading and reviewing. Um, in order to do this, they've been taken out of their normal uh, work lives. They've probably been uh, possibly been flown to DC and are in an uncomfortable hotel with people they might not like. So they're exhausted and looking to get through this quickly. You should give them every tool possible to make their job easy. Um, an, important, an important part of that is tables like the ones I just shown that clearly demonstrate what you're doing um, and that everything ties together and that you've thought about it carefully. Also, those charts and graphics should be big enough so that the text on the graphics is the same size, at least, as the text in the proposal itself. They should be easy to read. They should be easy to read when printed out on a piece of paper, which is even in 2022, how many people uh, read these proposals? I do. Um, so, uh, so again, it may, it may seem like you're eating up a lot of your page count with graphics. It's absolutely worth it, in my opinion. Also, verify that your um, your charts, your graphics, and your text have consistent terminology. This is easy if you use the work breakdown structure as the basis for your section headings, but terms defined in your Gantt chart, for example, or requirements listed in your task matrix should also appear in the text, maybe bolded so that it's easy to, for the reviewer to say, what is this thing in this chart? Oh, it's right there, now I know. Uh, they might not even read the description, they just want to know that you, uh, you wrote one. And um, uh, yeah, so those are the important things. I hit all of those. Uh, finally, every proposal should have a Gantt chart. 
that's a hard rule for my organization. Task matrices we find to be less important, but if your project is very complicated, if the agreement between project objectives and tasks is not super clear, then it's a really important thing to have. That's why they have it on missions, because those are, those are big projects with a lot of moving parts. Um, make sure every task is assigned to at least one team member. You can do that in the Gantt chart. I find that very useful, but it should also be explained in the proposal. Uh, that's the thing I've seen a lot of proposals fail on, is that not all named investigators or not all funded investigators have a specific job. And also not every job is owned by some specific investigator. If you've, if you've solved those dependencies in both directions, you'll be fine. Um, and then finally, you have to assume that reviewers don't know anything about project management because it's, again, not part of the training. So to that end, you will have to explain it to them. You'll have to explain to them that pairwise multiplication of an estimate of uncertainty factor is not merely magic. Um, and, uh, and for that purpose, in the document that I wrote, I have a paragraph of text that is the paragraph of text that we use as the template uh, in at Million Concepts that we drop into proposals that explains very quickly, this is the method we use, it has a basis, this is why we trust it. Um, to date, all review panels have accepted that. No one has accused us of not having a good basis for our, um, for, uh, of our, for our work plan or our funding requests or, um, or the, the, thing I, the thing I always fear is someone's going to accuse us of padding. Um, that has never happened. So you're welcome to use that paragraph of text as the basis for your own, and I suggest that you do. So quickly, we're in about 45 minutes, perfect. Um, Here's some, uh, here's some recommended reading. If you write software a lot for money, and especially if you ask for money to write software a lot, then I suggest you read everything on this page. Um, obviously one of these things I wrote, but if you read only one thing, read the first book, which is Software Estimation Demystifying the Black Art. Uh, this is like a classic in the literature for this. You can see how many notes I've made on it. Um, this will go over the estimation method I discuss, it will go over many others. It will describe the situations in which those are and are not good. Um, it's worth reading this book three times through if this is something you do for your career. The second book is uh, called Software Estimation Without Guessing. There is a lot of repeated information between these two books. This one I find a little more approachable and, um, and more interesting to me. This one goes into a lot of the sociology of actually getting the project done. So it talks about uh, talks about the, more about the arguments you might have with management when you bring them an estimate for a thousand hour project and they say, can you do it in 800? How do you respond to those situations? Especially if you're a junior person and you're not comfortable pushing back, this will help, uh, I think, give you the confidence to, um, to get the resources that you actually need to be successful. So there's a IEEE standard, I don't have a copy of it, but there are several books. Uh, this is one of them, the Project Manager's Guide to Software Engineering Best Practices that break those down. So there's a lot of textbooks um, on this sort of thing and uh, those documents are worth reading. And then finally, the BSSW fellowship document that I wrote. And then there was a previous presentation that I gave for uh, the Open Planetary um, Group, which is an international nonprofit that I helped co-found uh, that goes into a little bit more detail about the scoping and estimation part of what I've just covered. Um, it's, it's aimed uh, at a fairly low level, so if you have some familiarity with, uh, with those things, you might not gain much from it, but if you are new to these ideas, uh, it's, a, it's like a 35-minute um, whirlwind introduction. And then finally, a couple, I always like to include things that are not science and engineering. Um, I think it's important for us to know the context in which we do things, so I recommend anyone who does research software development, anyone who's a scientist, uh, read some of the sociology um, of science, science and technology studies, um, has a lot of good work. This is a book that I like, Bruno Latour, Science in Action, um, will, may give you new, it's probably not all correct, what is, but it, it will probably give you some new perspectives on the type of work we do and how we go about it. Um, also, good graphic design is important. Edward Tufte is the gold standard. Um, author on this topic. This is one of his books. I have all of his books on my bookshelf back there. They're all worth reading over and over again. Um, Thinking Fast and Slow, I don't have a book on that. 
or Influence. Both of these are pop psychology books uh, written by very credentialed people who know what they're talking about, about how people make decisions. And uh, reading through these books will give you some perspective about how to, for example, write a proposal so that it is convincing. Um, and, uh, and also when you are in the process of making, say, a requirements, uh, um, a, a list of requirements, how you can catch yourself and resist the urge to instantiate uh, technical solutions as requirements. Both of those I find very useful. And then this is a, a somewhat new book. This is for young software engineers. So if you're only a few years into this, um, this book covers a lot of things that the old hats uh, learned through pain and suffering. Um, and you, all you have to do is read this book and it will take you like four hours and then you will not make uh, some very classic silly mistakes. So I recommend that you read that if you're new. Uh, we're at a, good, we're on time. Um, my name is Chase Million. There's my contact information. Feel free to uh, email me with anything. And, uh, and I thank uh, BSFW, Exascale Computing, and the Department of Energy for, uh, for giving me the freedom to work on this uh, quite a bit over the last year. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chase. Um, let me see here. There is one question in the chat here. Mark, would you like to unmute and um, why I read for you? Sure. Sure thing. Um, Chase, thanks. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I was I wanted to ask if you could summarize for us anything that you, here that you regard as sort of specific to research software as opposed to, you know, sort of any old software project. Yeah, yeah. Um, I go into uh, I go into obnoxious detail on this in the document and uh, like like four pages of detail because it was it was a thing that caught my interest. I will try to state a few of the things. Um, so um, so one aspect is that the um, the project management roles that typically exist in an industry context or in a larger organization or even a larger research context, um, break down for smaller research projects, which is to say you don't have, there's not one person whose job is um, project manager and one person whose job is systems engineer and one person whose job is developer and so on and so on and so forth. Those are often the same person or those tasks are shared among the same handful of people. Your customer, is also um, ambiguous in a way. And to, and to that end, your deliverables are ambiguous and you have some flexibility in those. That gives you the freedom to, um, to have a little bit less confidence in your estimate because you will have the freedom later to change course if say you're in the third year of your three-year project and you have these three papers you can write, none of which are the thing you originally set out to write. In many research contexts, that's perfectly acceptable. And, it is allowed because the PI on research projects is the ultimate authority in what the project is going to be. Um, you also have a small groups of domain experts, um, which is to say there, so you're, ex, you're, in, you're going to be experts in your field, say that's low energy physics, um, who are not necessarily fully qualified software engineers, um, which is, is just, interesting and a thing to keep in mind. Um, oh geez, I had a lot of these and, I, and I'm blanking on the list, but I, I have a list of like 10 or 12 different uh, different aspects of research software. Oh, that, that was great, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I invite participants to unmute and ask directly to Chase. Any, or write in the chat. <laughs> some of your some of your references, um, some of the books that you reference, they were based in the uh, on premise world. Do you have any modern resources for cloud type development, or what's your opinion on that? Um, interesting question. It had not occurred to me to draw a line there. Um, a lot of our development in million concepts is, is cloud-based. 
Um, I think the techniques, I think the techniques do translate um, pretty well. If you have, if you have a specific reason for thinking that those should be thought of separately, let me know and I can. Well, just in class, you know, in reference to on-premise, you control almost everything in the development cycle, but in the cloud world, you sometimes are dependent on a lot of other third parties for their software to make yours work. And so just, you know, I'm just wondering about just, you know, sprints and cycles like that. Yeah, I, under, I understand the question. Um, I think that's, that is a, that is a ongoing project management kind of problem and not an estimation problem. Um, if you think, if you're in the estimation phase and you think those sorts of things are going to be huge bottlenecks for you, you should definitely take into that, uh, that into account. But managing that sort of, uh, managing the risk of that sort of thing, I think is something that you need to consider continuously while the project is underway. Thanks, thank you. Gen uh -huh. Oh, yes, I have a question. So um, I, I just don't have a good idea what could be a, like a, a research software versus like engineering. I, I just don't know. I want to know the you know clear kind of definition. Yeah. So I'm talking about this because we wrote a proposal and they consider this as a more of engineering side instead of research software. But we are both, I think this, no matter research or not, we do, you know, develop software for use. We don't want to just develop for not using it, right? <laughs> if you make it stop at of like, a, you know, proof of a concept level, I don't think it has a, you know, the, the impact it deserves, right? So I just want to know how you make your software development work appear as a research instead of, uh, you know, engineering? Um, I understand that problem and it's complete, that is a completely believable kind of response from a review panel for me. Um, uh, so so let, me, let me take it in two parts. First, uh, how I define research software is uh, any, any software developed in service to research. I know in some contexts, there are more specific ideas about what research software is like if the soft if the outputs of the software itself are the objects of study then that is research software for my purposes it's it can be a an excel macro if that's what you need to conduct your research and it can be um uh you know it can be your your multi-physics model that you're running on an hpc system um, if that's what you're doing so my definition of research software is very large and probably contains things that your review panel would be con would consider engineering. Um, I think a critical a critical part of research software as opposed to engineering, and this I, I pulled up my document. This is also a response to the earlier question, um, is that the work the work itself around the software is exploratory and novel. Um, so you don't necessarily, for, for like an engineering task, you have, um, you have fixed deliverables that will not change and fixed requirements and a fixed context and a fixed knowledge base. So there, there are things that, that are sort of set. Um, I mean, they all wiggle. But in a research context, it's sort of all up for grabs. You're going to start writing the software. You're going to learn something new about the data or the context or some new question is going to come in and everything is going to shift. And that's a property that exists less often in industry or I guess engineering context. Um, how you convince the, the second part is how you convince the panel of that. Uh, I do not know. Um, at least I do not know in a way that I can communicate because that, that comes down to just the, the art of persuasion, making the argument, what we call proposology, trying to sort of uh, head off <clears throat> every possible objection that this uh, anonymous panel of your, uh, your peers with unknown backgrounds may have. To the earlier question about the properties of research software, um, it's important for this estimation process that the work is novel and exploratory because so many estimation methodologies rely on uh, historical information about having done the work before. So you can imagine if you're 
if you're a website company and what you do is create websites for clients, over a few years, you will now have hundreds of examples of creating websites, have so many pages and so many links and the database is this big, it takes us this long to produce. Uh, in research context, we rarely have that sort of historical information, even if we do it minimal. There, you might have done one thing previously uh, that was similar. So for that reason, that immediately eliminates like a huge fraction of the good estimation strategies that you might uh, deploy. Yeah, thank you very much. That's really helpful. Yeah, thank you. Any further questions? We have a couple of minutes, I think, or, or um, more questions, if any. Mark. Uh, sure, real quick. Are, are you often using this approach in a sort of competitive bid process to uh, competing with other organizations for a for funding to, to uh, tackle a particular problem? Um, yes, uh, it's happen it's happening more. So historically, we've been in a, um, we've been writing research proposals where the at least in NASA world, I don't know how it is in a, for other agencies, but in NASA world, the a review panel actually doesn't see the total budget, so that's not part of the review. Um, so we, there's less pressure to keep the, the cost down. In the um, in like the government bid contract world, um, we have made the decision as an organization to not play the game where we try and get the bid as low as possible so that we can get the work. We actually ask for the amount of money that we need to do the work well. And we explain in the bid that we have done that and that we will do the work well and we have a track record of doing the work well. And so far that approach has been successful for us. Uh, I imagine we will get burned by it at some point, but to date, the people making those decisions have understood if you want certain things done well, it is going to cost you more money. So we've, we've made a decision to not compromise in that aspect. Let me ask you this question. Don't most government agencies have an obligation to take the lowest bid or at least consider the differences in the bids before they finalize? To just say you're going to charge more, uh, how does it be? Um, for the bids we have applied to, um, cost has never been the sole factor that they use. They will use, they'll, they'll tell you the criteria on which they will judge the bid. And for the bids we've applied to, it has always been a combination of um, of cost, um, anticipated quality of the work, and the track record of the um, of the contractor. So, in that combination of things, we've always done well. Again, I expect it to burn us at some point, but it's not universally the case that they have an obligation to take the low bid always. I just know it's in my experience some customers, some partners that have done that strategy. They, you know, they've either had, you know, that don't have low to win. They've done low bid. Then they've done like these IDIQs to, you know, if when the project needs more money. And, um, you know, I've just seen different strategies people use to win. Uh, yeah, that is that is a strategy that I am disinterested in. I would rather I would rather ask for the resources I need up front and be able to guarantee that we're going to deliver something good. And if we're not able to deliver something good with the resources that we're given, then I don't want to do the project. I would rather not do it at all. Thank you for your comment. Any further questions? Thank you very much again, Chase. Thank you. And thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I just pasted, but put in the chat the next webinar in the series will be in about a month and it will be about software packaging. Thank you all for joining us today. Okay, thank you.